Our first guest is Victoria Sakel, the Managing Director of Business Intelligence for Morning Consult, a global data intelligence company delivering insights on what people think in real time. Victoria leads the company's brand intelligence research, focusing on the intersection of data with marketing strategy, brand reputation, and consumer trends. Today, she's going to talk about brand love, as she just launched the 2020 Most Loved Brands Report, in addition to doing some earlier research on Gen Z, a topic which is near and dear to Vayner. Welcome, Victoria. Thank you. Hi, Victoria. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing today? I'm well. So let's get right into it, create some context building. Actually, before we get into it, I just wanna address the audience, especially the one that is very active on Twitter. Use the hashtag marketing for the now. Uh, I think I've established this summer that I absolutely uh, engage on Twitter while I'm interviewing our incredible people and, and use some of the insights and the questions. And I really appreciate when we quote uh, our incredible uh, guests. Uh, I think it brings a lot of value to it. So thank you everybody on the Twitter community uh, and obviously everybody watching on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. Thank you for being here. So Victoria, I think we should set up Morning Consultant uh, just for the individuals that don't know what it is. So maybe a, three or four minutes on your origin, what it is, a little bit about yourself. Um, uh, I think we should set that tone first. Sure. Um, I'll start with a little bit of my background because I think it tees up nicely the real opportunity um, Morning Consult is going after. Um, I kind of cut my teeth at Kantar for um, almost six years where I was client facing. Also worked across a number of, of course, you know, clients, geographies, industries, but um, thought a bit about the industry and our strategic positioning within that industry. Um, as I was kind of exploring new opportunities and, and thinking what next, um, Morning Consult crossed my radar because the speed and agility and real hunger that the company brings to, as Andrea said, you know, data insights, but um, in the sense of, you know, what's going on in real time, how do we get really deep insight, but also across ge geographies, demographics, psychographics, et cetera, how do we get those into hands of clients um, without the two to three week lag time, et cetera. Um, so what we're all about, you know, I focus on the brand vertical, there's also politics, there's also the econ side of things, all of these intersect to the whole ecosystem that brands and businesses operate in. Um, so I, you know, think about brands, but also working across these divisions, um, thinking about the reality, especially now where all of those things have really come to a head, um, and thinking about how they intersect and implicate um, brands and, and the kind of the role they play in consumer lives. I love that. Were, did you, were, as, a, as a kid, were you just curious about these things? Were you anthropologyed out? Were you, you know, math out? Like, or were you in a completely different place? And just out of my own curiosity, how did you like kind of stumble into the love around these data points? Yeah, so my background in college actually brought together some of my love for the math side of things, as well as brands and the feeling that I had a very kind of not brand related, but uh, my mom owns a, a baking business and I worked at you know, a hair salon where that was very local and watching how you treat customers and build a business and create this affinity that people, I didn't know the word affinity, I didn't know, you know much sure. about brands then, but translating that into kind of, there's data of course around it, but then how do you create a strategy um, funneled into my college degree, which then has translated to my career experience. I love it. Let's go into the part that really has me most fascinated, which is this most loved brands of 2020. Uh, how long have you, has the organization been doing this? Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then how did you go about getting to it? And uh, what, how do you distribute that information and what's been the reaction? Sure thing. So this is the fourth year uh, that we've done this report. So it's evolved kind of methodology wise over the past couple of years. Um, but just to kind of ground the audience, the components of brand love as we talk about it are favorability. So kind of positive attitude towards the brand, trust, pretty um, self-explanatory, community impact. So the degree to which brands have a, a positive impact in the community. And then for a little bit of the loyalty side of things, NPS. Um, and the way, you know, we think about it is it provides kind of a proxy for your progress through a funnel and your relationship with consumers that layers in a little bit more of the predictive emotional side of things. Um, in addition to you've got your numbers, you've got your financial performance that you can kind of 
look back on and use that to predict to the you know, future. Um, this year, of course, we had the coronavirus to take into consideration. So we built out the report a bit more to look at not only, you know, point in time brand love, but also pre-pandemic versus now 2019 versus now and to understand some of the dimensions of, you know, drivers of brand love, but also how those four ingredients have changed or not changed over time, because sometimes those results are just as interesting. Um, to your point about distributing this, I think our clients across industries, as well as, you know, companies big and small have really found this helpful as you think about what creates stickiness in relationships and, and how does that transcend not only the good times, but the bad times? How can the big brands learn from that, but also the younger brands and the up and comers um, use this time when they're maybe acquiring a lot of customers because people don't have other options or they're discovering them online or whatnot um, and build this foundation for retention and, you know, long loving relationships. Actually, that, that, that begs the question, like what, what impact, now that you have, since you do have four years, three years prior to this year, how has 2020 reshaped the kind of thinking around love? Like whether you're using the juxtaposition of pri prior, the first three months of the year to after, whether there's some sort of, you know, data or overlays of prior years to say, has there, have, are you ready? Cause I know it's early. So I know it's a tough question in some ways, but are you ready to have a working hypothesis or even maybe some deeper insight to what, what we're feeling here in the redefinition of expectations and love from brands? Sure. So there's two angles to that. First, I'll speak to the, the too early to tell side of things, which is when we look at the drivers of brand love, they very much reflect what people have been going through in recent months, as well as some of those things you know to be true. So reputation and availability probably always matter to people, definitely more so in recent months. How much they'll matter in the months and years ahead, especially when we're hopefully done and clear of a pandemic in particular, um, jury's still out, especially as things like sustainability and stakeholders start to weigh heavier into the equation. Um, in terms of what we know to be true right now, we see the category representation in um, our top 50, definitely reflecting, you know, the food and beverage household product brands that people need now. Of course, those are the ones that they're using more. And this is where you start to get into some of the marketing and, and kind of brand science around the things that people are using. They're going to build this stronger affinity for, and it kind of fuels this flywheel of, of love and, you know, um, recommending to peers or even to your kids as we're seeing in our Gen Z research, what parents are recommending to kids is sticking. Um, but, you know, kind of beyond that, the last point I'll make is when we look either versus last year to now or pre-pandemic this year to now, we see that the big brands really have continued to grow bigger. So the bigger, you know, some of the top leading 50 brands that are in the ranking would have been there, even if it weren't for a pandemic, which tells you, again, some of these, these are just, you know, truths around the emotional and kind of relational connection you have with your consumers. And, and brand love as it, you know, this is probably the most interesting question for me because I, I'm obsessed with both brand and marketing, but also with sales, you know, so, you know, I, uh, probably the most interesting thing of going into corporate life was, huh, these much bigger companies have such bigger companies that my dad had at a liquor store. They're really not looking at sales on a day-to-day, -day, second by second level, nor can they, right? Because I wasn't running a national commercial or putting my logo on a basketball jersey, you know, so I didn't have to really figure out what did that mean. Have you been able to create correlations of brand love to business performance? And how much of a challenge is that to get across the cynicism that maybe the client looks at that report like what what's the you know i find that it's been fascinating that a report whether it's a cantor or your company or nielsen's is blindly accepted and on, and every other report is like dead on arrival until it crosses the chasm of blindly accepted it's this really it's ironically a meta game of brand within themselves when i set up the question that way what's the kind of What's the things that run through your mind or the answers to those kind of questions? 
Yeah, first, I, I love the question and I'm equally obsessed because I think that, you know, I'm very aware having worked with clients, you cannot sit in an ivory tower and preach about, you know, your any sort of me metric without the dollar that goes behind it, whether it's the CMO who needs to report that or the CEO who cares about it. Um, so one of the exercises I, I definitely focused on this year was how do these correlate or particularly drive um, all of our steps of the funnel. So that could be awareness, it could be consideration, usage, and then even as I mentioned, we have NPS and kind of that loyalty, um, you know, kind of retention metric, if you will. Um, so we see, especially this year, there's a 49 point gap, which is massive um, in net purchasing consideration between our most loved brands and all other brands. So that's just consideration. That's, you know, if you're in the decision set, no, but you know, um, that funny. tells you I'm, that. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but like when I hear that, that makes the single most sense to me in the world. Right, I, you know, I think brand love will continue to rise in importance because I think the other thing that COVID has made clear to me and others is the friction of purchasing exactly what you want will continue to go away. And, and so one of the, for example, when I was a retailer, I did not want to sell the brands that had the most love because my dad and I store sold those items at dead cost because we were selling Kendall Jackson or Yellowtail or Santa Margarita at these prices to bring customers in, but everything in my store was designed to not let you buy it. It was on the bottom shelf. I would have humongous displays around it to make you buy a different Chardonnay for a dollar less. As we go into a more digital landscape where people can buy what they want to buy by just typing it into whatever queue, all of a sudden the end caps or all the other things that a retailer does to try to make you buy a more profitable item than the brand that you actually love, the friction's eliminated, which would create a scenario where the brands that are loved would actually gather more market share. Is that how you see it? Yes, and there's an important nuance around that, but I will Please. first completely agree that the, you know, this is, you know, we did a whole analysis around kind of the Byron Sharp men mentality around availability and mental availability being a big part of that. To your point exactly, if you, the first thing you search in is Clorox or um, Kleenex than any other tissue brand is screwed. Um, that's a big part of it. So you, it, it's a good flywheel for the big brands. It's a challenge for the smaller brands. But then we have Gen Z. So this generation, um, their awareness of big brands and their affinity for big brands is co a quarter basically of what it is for other generations, which tells you, um, you know, when we think about the brand portfolio that th this generation is aware of, the things that are cutting through, there's going to be a lot more things because they're very digitally active. Um, they're, you know, engaging with, they're thinking about different drivers, if you will, things like, again, stakeholders, how they're reacting Victoria, to social not, issues not, that are not, not only that, I apologize, you know, because I know we're wrapping out of time, but to your point, social issues and things of that nature, but there is a thing that very few talk about, which is the biggest brands in the world have continuously looked at these social network channels as afterthoughts of places to build brand. They think they're bring, building brand on television and they'll do some matching luggage social media posts while other brands have actually done true marketing and nothing's changed with Gen Z and, and the greatest generation. What's changed is the biggest brands in the world are allocating less money and energy than even tiny brands in these channels, thus losing market share because that's where the attention graph is. Yeah, no, you're totally right. And it only becomes more of an issue as you think about this younger generation leaning especially into those channels if you're not there in the way that feels authentic and intuitive. Um, it's a big risk for sure. Victoria, thank you so much. I'm sorry we're out of time, but we're trying to get to everybody today, but we're really appreciative and we wish you all the best. Andrea?